Hello everyone. The Apostle tells us in Ephesians 5, verse 19, Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we read in Thessalonians, chapter 5, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now these verses state quite plainly that thankfulness should be a well-rounded, consistent response to whatever God allows to happen in our lives. They also carry the implication that such a thankful attitude is impossible in our own strength, but that, as believers, we have the Spirit of Christ in us, and He graciously enables us to be thankful at all times, without exception. The verse in Ephesians tells us to give thanks for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thessalonians says to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. But wait a minute, what does it mean, give thanks for all things? Clearly, there are many, many blessings that we must not neglect to be grateful for. Some primary examples are God's goodness and mercy, the gift of Christ Jesus, his victory over death, and then there are all the temporal blessings which God showers on each of us every day. Our daily bread, warmth, shelter, the gift of family, children, a good measure of health, and so on. But giving thanks for all things surely has to include the hard things. And we read in James chapter 1 verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So if we are to consider it pure joy when we face all kinds of trials, Surely we should be thanking God for them. I just want to read uh, a couple of paragraphs from Corrie ten Boom's account of the terrible trials she faced when in German concentration camps during the Second World War. A um, book called The Hiding Place. Uh, many of you will be familiar with it. It's probably a long time since you read it. It was first published in 1971. For anyone who doesn't know, it tells the story of um, Corrie ten Boom, a, a Dutch woman who took in Jews in occupied Holland to try and help them evade the Gestapo. She was eventually informed on and along with her sister Betsy thrown into prison and from there over the course of the next year was moved to first one then another concentration camp. On the day that they uh, arrived in the second camp, Ravensbrück, Corrie tells how they were led by a guard to where they would be confined. On either side, doors opened into two still larger rooms, by far the largest dormitories we had yet seen. Betsy and I followed a prisoner guide through the door at the right. Because of the broken windows, the vast room was in semi-twilight. Our noses told us first that the place was filthy, somewhere plumbing had backed up. The bedding was soiled and rancid. Then, as our eyes adjusted to the gloom, we saw that there were no individual beds at all, but great square piers stacked three high and wedged side by side and end to end, with only an occasional narrow aisle slicing through. We followed our guide single file. The aisle was not wide enough for two, fighting back the claustrophobia of these platforms rising everywhere above us. The tremendous room was nearly empty of people they must have been out on various work crews. At last, she pointed to a second tier in the centre of a large block. To reach it, we had to stand on the bottom level, haul ourselves up, and then crawl across three other straw-covered platforms to reach the one that we would share with how many? The deck above us was too close to let us sit up. We lay back, struggling against the nausea that swept over us from the reeking straw, we could hear the women who had arrived with us finding their places. Suddenly I sat up, striking my head on the cross slats above. Something had pinched my leg. Fleas, I cried. Betsy, the place is swarming with fleas. 
We scrambled across the intervening platforms, heads low to avoid another bump, dropped down to the aisle and edged our way to a patch of light. Here, and another one, I wailed. Betsy, how can we live in such a place? Show us, show us how. It was said so matter-of-factly, it took me a second to realise she was praying. More and more, the distinction between prayer and the rest of life seemed to be vanishing for Betsy. Collie, she said excitedly, he's given us the answer before we asked, as he always does. In the Bible this morning, where was it? Read that part again. I glanced down the long, dim aisle to make sure no guard was in sight and drew the Bible from its pouch. It was in First Thessalonians, I said. We were on our third complete reading of the New Testament since leaving Sheveningen. In the feeble light, I turned the pages. Here it is. Comfort the frightened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that none of you repays evil with evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. It seemed written expressly to Ravensbrook. Go on, said Betsy. That wasn't all. Oh yes, to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. That's it, Corey, that's his answer. Give thanks in all circumstances. That's what we can do. We can start right now to thank God for every single thing about this new barracks. I stared at her, then around me at the dark, foul-aired room. Such as, I said, such as being assigned here together. I bit my lip. Oh yes, Lord Jesus. Such as what you're holding in your hands. I looked down at the Bible. Yes, thank you, dear Lord, that there was no inspection when we entered here. Thank you for all the women here in this room who will meet you in these pages. Yes, said Betsy. Thank you for the very crowd in here. Since we're packed so close, the many more, that many more, will hear. She looked at me expectantly. Corrie? She prodded. Oh, all right. Thank you for the jammed, crammed, stuffed, packed, suffocating crowds. Thank you, Betsy went on serenely, for the fleas and for... The fleas? This was too much. Betsy, there's no way even God can make me grateful for a flea. Give thanks in all circumstances, she quoted. It doesn't say in pleasant circumstances. Fleas are part of this place where God has put us. And so we stood between piers of banks and gave thanks for the fleas. But this time I was sure Betsy was wrong. And then several pages later, Corrie's speaking of how after becoming quite ill, Betsy was given a job knitting socks and she was able to, um, how she was able to read the Bible to other prisoners since there are usually uh, no guards in this area. And it's just a short bit. <clears throat> Best of all, as a result of her hospitalisation, Betsy was given a permanent assignment to the Knitting Brigade, the women we had seen that very first day seated about the tables in the centre room. This work was reserved for the weakest prisoners and now overflowed into the dormitories as well. Lost my place. Um, those working in the sleeping rooms received far less supervision than those at the tables, and Betsy found herself with most of the day in which to minister to those around her. She was a lightning knitter who completed her quota of socks long before noon. She kept our Bible with her and spent hours each day reading aloud from it, moving from platform to platform. One evening I got back to the barracks late from a wood-gathering foray outside the walls. Uh, Betsy was waiting for me as always so that we could wait through the food line together. Her eyes were twinkling. You're looking very pleased with yourself, I told her. You know, we've never understood why we had so much freedom in the big room, she said. Well, I have found out. That afternoon, she said, there'd been confusion in her knitting group about sock sizes. And they'd asked the supervisor to come and settle it. But she wouldn't. She wouldn't step through the door and neither would the guards. And you know why? Betsy could not keep the triumph from her voice. Because of the fleas, that's what she said. That place is crawling with fleas. My mind rushed back to our first hour in this place. 
I remembered Betsy's bowed head, remembered her thanks to God for creatures I could see no use for. Well, you may think that's a bit of an extreme example, but thinking back to that verse about considering it all pure joy whenever we face trials of many kinds, how does, for example, COVID fit into this? Have we been thanking God for it? Well, I think we have, to some extent. I've certainly been involved in discussions about what some of the positives might be. Online worship services, potentially reaching a much wider audience. People in a state of anxiety and fear for the future, maybe more receptive to the gospel, and so forth. And in our prayers, we thanked God for the technology that allows us to meet on Zoom and how this allows fellowship for some members of our church family who can't physically get out to a church gathering. But what of the future? There is talk now of a second wave of COVID and perhaps a second lockdown. Do we view this prospect with trepidation, praying that God will prevent that happening? Or are we simply trusting that God knows what he's doing? All things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So whatever happens, it's ordained by God for our good, and we can therefore look forward to doing his bidding in that event, according to his purpose. As we know, God doesn't always show us how everything happens in our lives for our ultimate good. In the book, Corrie thanked God for the fleas because Betsy said they must, but she really didn't think it was the right thing to do, not at the time anyway. So in the event of a second lockdown, are we ready to thank God, knowing that he will work out his purposes in his own perfect way and timing? Who knows, perhaps over the last six months, we haven't really acted on opportunities to share the gospel. Perhaps in his infinite wisdom and grace and patience, God's about to gift us a second chance. For instance, before anyone starts shouting at the screen, I'm not suggesting that COVID is somehow a good thing. And I'm not trying to minimise the suffering it has caused for many people around the world. I'm, I'm simply saying that for the believer, it's, it's, kind of, it's like the classic case at the end of the Joseph story, where Joseph ended up in Egypt because his brothers intended to harm him, but God intended it for good, saving many lives, as it turned out. God doesn't create evil, and evil is never good. But sometimes... It is good that evil happens. In closing, thankfulness in all things is what we should be striving for, but at the same time, the Lord knows our frailty, our weakness. He knows we love him, but he also knows that our love for him is so fickle. It grows cold, often. It's imperfect, always. So when huge tragedies come our way that we just can't thank God for, or when someone commits an injustice against us which we are unable to forgive. Or even when something happens and we find we are just angry with God. He knows. He understands. That doesn't make it okay, but we can run to him and ask for his help. And he won't turn us away. And I'll leave the last word to Job. As Job sits there covered head to toe in sores, his family and possessions destroyed, he declares, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord.